Okay, so now that we've talked about quasi-experiments and what makes them different from real lab experiments, um, and uh, the importance of interaction terms and how they work in regression models, and we can now talk about difference in difference approaches and how they work as quasi-experiments and how you can analyze them and what, um, like how you can actually find causal inference based on them. Um, and so the main intuition behind difference in differences is this idea that two wrongs make a right. Um, you can't just analyze half of a difference in difference situation. Um, that will give you a correlation is not causation um, effect. But if you combine two of those, um, then you can actually find a causal effect. And th the way this works, especially in policy analysis, is it relies heavily on some places doing something and some other places not doing something and then hoping that those places that do things or not do things are very similar to each other. Um, so in your reading from the causal inference mixtape, you saw this idea here that federalism, um, especially in the United States, is actually really good for um, generating causal effects or calculating causal effects of specific policies because states are kind of the laboratories of democracy. They get to choose what policies they want to implement. Um, and often, if there's kind of a wave towards eventual federalization of some sort of policy, you'll get states doing specific things at a state level, and then eventually there'll they'll be kind of a, a federal level that kind of wipes it all out. Um, and so you might have states um, issuing specific um, carbon um, caps for, for emissions, um, and so one state might, might implement some sort of new environmental policy and its neighboring state doesn't. If you have a situation like that, then you could plausibly talk about one state as the treatment group and the other state as the control group. Um, the United States is full of these types of things because of this idea of federalism. You don't have one single law coming from the federal government rolling out nationwide. You get all sorts of essentially policy experiments and you can jump on board with those experiments. Um, so as an example of this, um, what happens if you raise the minimum wage? Um, this is a question from economics. If you uh, took a past economics class as part of your MPA class or MPP program, um, you talked about this. And what's interesting is it's basically a question of supply and demand at its core. If you raise the price for labor, then the supply for it will change and the demand for it will change and you'll generally have a lower um, quantity. Um, because the price goes up. So if the price goes up, then the equilibrium means you have to have kind of a lower quantity. So in general, economic theory says if you raise the minimum wage, there should be fewer jobs because um, price goes up, quantity goes down. Um, but that's just what the theory says with supply and demand curves. Um, does that actually bear out in real life? Um, this is tricky to measure. It's hard to kind of find the exact causal effect of raising the minimum wage because if you wanted to do this in a randomized controlled trial setting, you would have to go to some state and have them randomly assign people to have a higher minimum wage and randomly assign people to have a lower minimum wage. And that is wildly unethical. Um, so we don't do that. So instead, you have to turn to quasi-experiments um, and see if you can find comparable treatment and control groups um, because you can't assign people to have a lower minimum wage. So this has actually happened lots of times throughout um, history. States get to set their own minimum wages. There's a federal minimum wage of like seven fifteen or seven twenty five or something ridiculously low right now, um, but states also get to set their own minimum wages. So, in New Jersey, in 1992, um, they raised their minimum wage at a state level from four twenty five an hour to five oh five an hour, um, which is a, a pretty sizable jump right there. Um, so what economists did back in the 90s is they saw that this was potentially a natural experiment or not a natural experiment, a quasi experiment um, because New Jersey raised its minimum wage, but neighboring states did not. Um, specifically, Pennsylvania did not. Um, Pennsylvania is a big state, um, especially like Western Pennsylvania is wildly different from Eastern Pennsylvania, which is right on the border with New Jersey. Um, but what the researchers did is they looked just at um, at uh, restaurants and other businesses that were really close to New Jersey. Um, so Eastern Pennsylvania, which is more comparable to New Jersey. Um, and so they essentially said, this is like a treatment and control group, um, Eastern Pennsylvania and New Jersey. And one state increased their minimum wage and one state didn't. So let's see if there's a change in employment. 
um, are restaurants hiring fewer people because minimum wage is up. Um, so what they measured was the average number of jobs in fast food restaurants. And so in New Jersey specifically, um, they calculated a couple different numbers. Um, on average, there were about 20.4 workers per fast food restaurant before the change in policy, so like 1990, 1991. Um, after the change in policy, that increased to 21.03 workers on average. Um, so that change right there, the difference between those is 0.59. So it looks like um, raising taxes or raising the minimum wage, not taxes, raising the minimum wage in New Jersey caused restaurants to hire half a worker more on average. Um, is that the causal effect then? We're just taking before and after within New Jersey. Um, the difference went up by 0.5. Cool. There's our causal effect. Can you legally talk about that? No. Um, because we can't compare New Jersey to any other place. Maybe there was just something going on in the country that made it so all fast food restaurants were hiring more people. Um, Pennsylvania may have been hiring more people too. New York may have been hiring more people. Um, and so there's no control state to compare with New Jersey. And so we don't actually know if this is the causal effect. So just doing before and after comparisons within a group is not enough to talk about causal effects. That is wrong. So you can't do that. So what if instead you say, fine, we can't do before and after, so let's just look at treatment and control. So we look at the average number of fast food restaurant employees after the policy change in Pennsylvania and in New Jersey. So Pennsylvania, after New Jersey rose, or rose its, um, raised its minimum wage, it had an average of 21.1 workers in its restaurants. Um, and New Jersey had an average of 21.03. So if we subtract um, treatment minus control here, um, it looks like on average um, there were fewer jobs in New Jersey restaurants than there were in Pennsylvania restaurants. And so now it looks like there was a negative effect of raising the minimum wage. Um, so is that the causal effect? Um, and the answer is no, because there's no pre-level to compare with. Maybe both states went up. Um, maybe both went down. We don't actually know. This is just one point in time here. So we still need that before and after situation that we saw before um, back here. Um, but we also need a treatment, or we, we need a comparison between treatment and control. Um, so we need to measure both of those things simultaneously to be able to get this causal effect. Just looking at treatment and control or just looking at before and after is not going to be correct. Both of those causal estimates aren't actually causal estimates, they're wrong. Um, so yeah, if you're comparing only before and after, you're only looking at the treatment group, and so it's impossible to know if any change happened because they raised the minimum wage or just because the economy was changing nationwide and it would have happened on its own. If you're comparing just treatment and control, then you're only looking at post-treatment values. You don't know what happened before, and so it's impossible to know if any change happened just because of natural growth. Um, across, um, like, between and across these different groups here. So you can't actually get at the answer with only one of these things. Um, this is more clear if we draw a DAG for this. Um, so if we look at this DAG here, we have minimum wage increase is causing some change in jobs. But that relationship here, this arrow that we want to identify or isolate, is confounded by time or the year that minimum wage happens and year influences jobs and being in New Jersey. That's where the policy change happened. And so being in New Jersey causes some difference in minimum wage and it causes some change in jobs. So both the location and the time are confounders for this relationship here. So if we think about adjustment, we need to do something statistically to time and something statistically to location or being in New Jersey um, to be able to isolate this effect between minimum wage and jobs, um, which is what difference in difference lets you do. This is just the DAG version of diff and diff. So with the New Jersey and Pennsylvania example, we saw that you can't just calculate a before and after effect or a treatment and control effect. You have to somehow incorporate both. And the best way to do this is to actually think of this as this two by two matrix here, where you have a column for before and after, and you have rows for treatment and control. And you can plug in average values for each of these groups. So if you can figure out the average control 
um, the, the average value in the control group before the policy and the average value for the control group after the policy, um, and same thing for treatment, um, then you end up with these four numbers and you can start subtracting them to find effects. Um, but you have to do this carefully um, because it's really tempting to think that one of these might be the causal effect, which is what we saw um, in the previous couple slides where we said this is wrong just doing before and after or just doing treatment and control. You actually need to incorporate both. So assuming you have these four numbers here, this A, B, C, D stuff here, um, what we can do is subtract some things and find some differences in these different values. So if we go... Um, horizontally, what this lets us find is the pre or the post minus pre difference within each of these groups. So within the control group, if we find the post mean and subtract the pre mean, that shows us the effect of the program just in the control group or the growth that happened in the control group. So it's not a causal effect. It's just this is how much the, con the control group changed from before and after the policy. We can do the same thing here with the treatment group. We find the post mean and subtract the pre mean. This is what we did on the very first slide when we talked about New Jersey. Um, after the policy change, they had some amount of average employees per fast food restaurant, and before they had some other level. And if you subtract that, it looks like there was some change because of the policy. But we can't isolate that because all we're really finding is this D minus C. That's not incorporating any differences between treatment and control. That's just saying there was some growth within this group here um, and within New Jersey itself. So within unit growth is what we have here. Okay, so neither of those are the causal effect. We can also find differences if we go down this way. Um, so if we look at this, the C minus A is treatment, the, the average value for treatment minus the average value for control, but only before the program. And so this is the difference between New Jersey and Pennsylvania, for instance, but only before the program. This is the same thing that we calculated on the second slide when we said we can't just look at New Jersey before and after. Let's look at New Jersey and Pennsylvania, compare them. By doing that comparison, this is what we did. We said... Um, D, which was New Jersey after the policy change, minus B, which was Pennsylvania after the policy change. So that effect that we found here was just D minus B. It's the, the growth that happens across these two groups, the control group and the treatment group. It's not the actual causal effect. If we want to find the causal effect, we have to combine these two things, combine the two differences, which is why we call this difference in differences. So what we can do is we can subtract, we can say D minus B minus C minus A, which then lets us incorporate both the pre and post values and the treatment and control values, which if you remember from the DAG, those were our two confounding factors. We had location and we had year or time that was confounding that relationship. So if we statistically deal with those somehow, in this case by, sub, by finding differences, um, and then subtracting those differences, then we can isolate that one arrow. So that leads us to this table here. Um, and the nice thing about this is it works both ways. We could do treatment minus control um, with the differences for post and pre here. So we could do DC minus BA. That will give us the diff and diff effect. We could also do um, D minus B minus C minus A. That'll give us the same number. doesn't matter which way we go. Either one of those will work. And ultimately, this cell right here, that is the difference in difference estimator, and that is the causal effect of the program um, or of the policy. And the reason it is causal is because it's taking care of both time and location or group. Um, and so this is the, the notion of two wrongs make a right. This by itself is not a causal effect. This by itself, not a causal effect. Combine the two, this minus that, now you have a causal effect, and you can talk about it legally using the language of causation. Um, the more formal, official way of writing this is with, with this math equation here. You say DD, which is the difference in difference estimator, is just the average, um, of your, the average value that you care about for the treatment group after the program, minus average treatment pre, minus average control post, minus average control pre. That's the same idea as this D minus C minus B minus A thing. Um, just in more mathy um, 
terms here. So if we go back to the Pennsylvania and New Jersey example, we can use actual numbers here instead of A, B, C, and D. Um, and so what we can see, um, what we calculated on the slides before was um, this right here. We found New Jersey before and after the program added half an employee on average. Um, but then if we looked at Pennsylvania and New Jersey just after the program and compared treatment and control, then it looked like um, the program caused a loss of jobs. And so that was kind of some conflicting findings there. But that's because neither of those are causal effects. They're just the within unit group growth or the across unit growth, um, which we don't really care about. We care most about the causal effect. So what we can do instead is we can calculate either um, this B minus A and D minus C stuff, or we can calculate the D minus B and the C minus A. Either one of those will work. And then we subtract them from each other. So right here, this is going to be this column version. So we're going to say D minus C, which is this 0.59, minus negative 2.16. And so that gives us a causal effect of 2.76. We could do the same thing going this way. We could say negative 0.14 minus negative 2.89 is also going to be 2.76. Either way, it's going to give you the same number. And this is our causal effect this is what we can talk about as what the program actually did. So according to this number, it looks like the, um, the change in minimum wage, the rise in minimum wage, caused New Jersey fast food stores or restaurants to increase employment by 2.76 positions on average. So it actually increased um, employment, not decreased employment, which is what the economists and economic theories said would happen. Um, so it was the opposite of what was predicted from economic theory. Um, and that is the actual causal effect. It gets a little bit confusing because um, it looks like it hurt in some places. Like if you look at Pennsylvania, um, before, the, before New Jersey's um, tax change, um, they were at 23 um, jobs on average, and then they dropped down to 21. So it looks like just over time, natural trends in the region made it so there were job losses. And so New Jersey did not see those same job losses. They went from 20.4 to 21.03. And so the reason this causal effect is so big here, before that just looks like half a position, but really it's like 2.7, it's because New Jersey, by instituting this, this rise in minimum wage, kind of offset and reversed the weird economic decline that was happening in the control group in Pennsylvania. And so you end up with this 2.76 causal effect because of the program. Um, and that is the thing that you can report. And this is what is in um, this famous econo or econometrics paper. It shows that the rise in minimum wage caused 2.76 more jobs on average. Um, and you can find this from this diff and diff analysis, where we're taking differences across these two groups um, either pre and post or con treatment and control, and then subtracting those differences um, so that we account for both pre and post and treatment and control, resulting in the causal effect. Um, so here's a kind of classical version of a diff and diff graph. This is not the minimum wage example. This is just fake data I made up here. Um, but what we have is a treatment group and a control group. Um, these are that those same cells, the A, B, C, and D cells that we had back here. Here's our A, B, C, and D cells. So you can actually graph, you can make that same graph here using this data here. You can draw it on paper even um, because you have those four numbers. So here's these four numbers here. So the intuition here where we're getting the causal effect is if we imagine that the trend between like in the treatment group is at some level, doesn't matter if it's higher or lower than the control group. What matters is if we say it would keep going and would follow the control group about the same, this is where it should be after the intervention. And this is where it actually is after the intervention. That difference between the hypothetical endpoint and the actual endpoint, that is your causal effect. That is the delta that we care about. That is how, that's the actual change. So if this was the minimum wage example, this would be a 2.7 um, distance right there between the hypothetical outcome um, had the same trend kept going and then what actually happened. And that is the diff and diff finding right there. Um, so if you can plot your diff and diff um, 
um, analyses, that's great because seeing this is pretty intuitive for anybody. Um, especially if you have this dotted line, you say group A or treatment group would have kept going, they would have ended up here, but because of our policy, look, they ended up way higher. And this is the actual causal effect of this policy because the control group didn't change at all. Um, so that's kind of the visual intuition behind diff and diff here. Um, so is there an easier way to do this? Um, if we were in person, I would actually have you um, calculate uh, the diff and diff stuff here, I would give you four numbers for before, after treatment and control for some hypothetical example. And then you'd get in the little groups and you would calculate all of the B minus A, D minus C, B minus A minus D minus C stuff to find the, the effect here. And that gets really, really tedious to do um, because it's just a lot of subtracting. There are things that can go wrong as you're doing it. Um, so that's it's tricky. The other trick or another tricky part is this right here doesn't give you any extra statistics. You don't know um, the confidence interval around this. You don't know anything about um, kind of statistical uncertainty around this this average here or this average here. And then you're combining the two averages. That's going to mess up with that's going to combine the uncertainty and you lose all of that information if you're just using averages by themselves. If you're doing this two by two grid thing, you lose all of the ability to talk about p-values and significance and um, t-tests and all of that other stuff. You're just working with the numbers. Um, and so that can be bad. Um, finally, what if there are other backdoors to worry about? Um, right now, we've been talking about just time and location are the only things um, confounding the relationship between minimum wage and um, uh, jobs. But maybe there are other things that also confound, like the political party of the governors or other things that are happening that could confound that relationship. Um, if we want to statistically deal with those confounders, maybe we want to stick them in as control variables or do some sort of matching or inverse probability weighting, um, then that's going to get even trickier to figure out those four numbers, your A, B, C, and D cells. So that's hard to do. So what can we do instead of calculating the A, B, C, D cells by hand? We can use regression. Um, and this is why we talked about interactions, because this is how you um, figure out that, that combination of um, treatment and after. So if we go back to the DAG here, we have confounders of time or location or, of, uh, or before and after. And then we have being in New Jersey, which is location or the group. So you have a treatment group and a control group. Um, that's this being in New Jersey thing. So both of those things are confounding. We want to somehow deal with those. Um, so we could deal with them by sticking them in a regression model. Um, as we talked about when we talked about matching and inverse probability weighting, this isn't always the best approach because you have to assume that the relationship between all of these things here are linear um, between each other. In, and so that's why we do matching or inverse probability weighting because um, you don't have to make that linearity assumption. In this case, though, it's okay. Um, because these are all indicator variables. They're all binary. So the group is just going to be New Jersey or Pennsylvania. Time is going to be before or after. So you don't need to worry about linear relationships or anything between these. You can just include them as control variables, and then that is kind of like adjusting for those nodes in the DAG. So if you run a model like this here, where you have your outcome, so maybe this is the number of employees per restaurant, is explained by some group. So this is your treatment and control variable. Time, so this is before and after. And then the interaction of group and time. What this does is this will give you the difference in difference estimate. Because what we're trying to find, if we go back to the cells here, to our A, B, C, and D here, um, the thing we care about right here is this number, which is what happens. It's the effect of combining the the pre minus or the post minus pre and the treatment minus control. So we want what happens when both of those things are turned on. So that's our ultimate goal is to find that combination of those two things. So if you run this regression model um, and assume that group is either one if it's treatment, or zero if it's control, or true if it's treatment, false if it's control, um, and then time is going to be same thing, one if it's after, zero if it's before, or true if it's after, false if it's before. Um, then what you get is the interpretation of each of these coefficients 
um, is a specific part of that cell and it or of, of that table, that two by two grid that we saw. Um, and you can interpret each of these coefficients specifically. So if you just look at the intercept or that alpha term, that's going to be the average for the control group before the treatment. That's one of the cells in our, um, in our table that we care about. Um, the coefficient for group is going to be the increase in the outcome across the groups. So it's going to be the between group differences. The time coefficient, this gamma here, is going to be the increase in outcome over time without, within the units. And so that's going to be the difference within treatment and the difference within um, control. So just the time-based differences, which are wrong. So if we go back to the, the example we talked about, the two wrongs, make a, two wrongs make a right, this is one of the wrongs. It's just saying this is treatment minus control. This is one of the wrongs. This is before minus after, but only those two. But because we're interacting these two, what we get is treatment minus control and before or after minus before. If we combine those two, this right here is our difference in differences um, estimate that we can get directly from a, co from a regression table. So one really cool thing about using regression for difference in differences instead of a manual two by two table is that you can actually build the manual two by two table um, using the regression coefficients. So if you notice here, if you're interpreting this regression model, your alpha is the intercept. And so um, when you're interpreting the intercept, that's the, the predicted outcome or the average outcome when all of the other variables are turned off. So when group is set to zero and when time is set to zero. When group is set to zero, that means the control group. When time is set to zero, that means before. And so the control before value is just going to be that intercept value. So if you have a, a regression table, um, whatever that intercept is going to be is going to be that corner of that of this table. Um, if you want to figure out the the value for the after average for the control group, that's just a matter of taking the existing average for the intercept and adding the time coefficient. Because remember, this is a switch. So we're switching time on. And that makes some additional change in the outcome because time is turned on there. And so, because that's the switch we're talking about. So you can piece these things together. Um, so that the post mean for the control group is going to be whatever the coefficient for alpha is plus whatever the coefficient for gamma is. If you just want to know the differences, um, a, with or across pre and post just for the control group, that's the same as keeping the, the, the beta for group to zero, keeping that switch off, and then you're just switching the time coefficient on and off. And that's the gamma. That's how much change there is in the outcome because time is one or time is zero, which is the same thing as this um, gamma coefficient right here. So you can piece all of these other cells together if you really, really wanted to. Um, to build the, the same two by two table or three by three table in this case, because we have these margins here, um, using regression coefficients. But what really matters ultimately, you don't really need to do that because that is tedious and you don't need to show every one of these cells here. The most important cell in all of this is this delta, because that is this corner here. That's our magic causal inference corner. That's the difference in difference column. Um, that's this treatment minus control. Notice how even the coefficients disappear and you're left like gamma minus gamma disappears. You're left with this delta. Same thing here. You have beta plus delta minus beta. Betas go away. You're left with delta. And delta is the thing you care about the most. That's the causal effect. So rather than doing the whole table thing, you can just look at the coefficient in your regression results and whatever delta is, is that corner. And that's your causal effect. And so when we get to the R examples um, later, if you go to the examples page, we'll walk through an example of doing this with regression and with a two by two table. And you'll be able to see that the causal effect just shows up right in the regression um, table. You just have to know what row to look at to find the delta. Um, and the row you're looking at is the interaction term row. And once you um, identify that, you have found the causal effect. Um, so this works either way with the table or with regression. It's way easier with regression because you're just looking for one value instead of calculating a bunch of stuff and subtracting it and subtracting it again. Um, that gets really tedious. The regression way is far easier and um, easier to interpret. So let me show you an example of um, regression output for a more basic example here. If we go back to the hot dogs. 
um, example here. So let's say we have a data set here of four different hot dogs. Um, we have the price column, so two, 235, 235, and 270. We have a column for cheese and a column for chili. So some of them, um, this one has cheese, this one also has cheese. These last two have chili, so this very last one has chili and cheese. Okay, so if we think about this in diff and diff language, um, this might be a treatment group and this might be a before and after, or treatment and control, before and after. Um, they're just both binary variables here. So if we run a regression using this tiny data set here, um, you can actually see the different coefficients emerge here. So here's our regression. We're going to say price is explained by cheese plus chili plus cheese times chili. So that way we get the cheese effect, we get the chili effect, and we get the cheese times chili effect. And here is our regression output. And so this is our alpha right here, our intercept. So this is the average price when everything is turned off. So cheese is off, chili is off. So it's going to be $2. Um, this coefficient is our beta. Um, and so that means cheese, if that is on, um, the price is going to be 0 0.35, 35 cents higher on average. Um, if this was a before and after variable, um, or what were we, we weren't talking about before, this is our group if we're talking about diff and diff. So this would be like treatment and control. Um, the treatment group would be some amount higher or some amount lower. Um, our chili estimate here would be similar to the time. So that would be like before and after. Um, and so if the chili is after, um, then it's going to be 0.35 higher. And finally, we have this right here. Our estimate for the chili times cheese effect is actually zero because there's no causal effect or extra effect that comes from combining cheese and chili um, on price. Um, you don't get any bonus, um, or it's not even more expensive because you combined them. Again, if this was 250 for chili and cheese at the same time, um, this coefficient here would be um, 0.5, um, or it would be negative 0.2 because it'd be, yeah, negative 0.2 because it'd be cheaper by 20 cents um, because you're after combining them, because it should be 270, but it's down to 250, and so that difference is going to be 20 cents. And so that would be the causal effect of getting both chili and cheese at the same time. Um, and so again, like each of these coefficients here fits into that regression model, um, and they fit into specific aspects of um, your before and after and treatment and control idea. Um, and then this is the magical causal effect number that you care about when you're interpreting regressions. So here in this diff and diff example, we'd say there's no effect, there's no causal effect on price of combining chili and cheese. Um, in the R example for this session, um, we will see kind of the effect of a policy change on a specific out on a specific outcome. And to do that, we will look specifically at the interaction effect or the interaction term coefficient. So that's the thing you care about the most. Um, it's the same. We would get these same results here if we plug these into that two by two grid. Instead of saying before, after treatment control, we could say cheese, no cheese, chili, no chili, and then plug in all those numbers and we'd get that same corner difference and difference estimate and it would be zero. Um, but that's really tedious and long. We don't want to do that. So if we just do a regression, stick an interaction term here. So this would be treatment times um, before, after, or in this case, chili times cheese, um, it'll give us the causal effect of the combination of the two, which is what we care about. Um, so one brief example of this in real life here, um, using observational data. Um, so some researchers back in 2016, um, when Pokemon Go was a big thing, um, they wanted to see if there was a causal effect of using Pokemon Go on activity. Um, physical activity or people walking more because they're using Pokemon Go. Um, the tricky part about this is you can't really randomize people into this. You can't um, have a randomized control trial where you tell some people to do Pokemon Go and some people to not touch it um, because you, you can't do that. Um, it, that's really hard to do because anybody can just self-select into things. And so what they did instead is they used a kind of quasi-experiment where they just did a survey on um, Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is a place where you can just 
um, post Qualtrics links and people can take surveys um, and you pay them some amount of money for taking your survey. Um, they did um, a cohort study where they actually found a bunch of people and checked in with them every week um, so they could track the same person over time. And so what they did is they wanted to see if people who used Pokemon Go had more steps on average than people who didn't. Um, and it worked because iPhones um, track your steps. So they didn't have to find people with Fitbits or anything. They just found people with iPhone 6s um, that either used Pokemon Go or didn't use Pokemon Go. Um, and they tracked these people for weeks before and weeks after they installed Pokemon Go. And so what they ended up with was a chart that looks like this. Um, so they tracked people four weeks, like a month before Pokemon Go was released. Um, they were checking in with people to see how many steps per day they were taking. So on average, it was like 4,000, maybe 4,500-ish steps. Everybody's kind of very, very similar here. Then Pokemon Go was released, and the players, the people who voluntarily put this on their phone, started walking like 1,000 more steps per day um, because of Pokemon Go, because you have to go around to the different um, Pokestops and um, do whatever Pokemon things you do. Um, and then they kept tracking these people over time, and eventually that, that boost in steps started to decrease, and after six weeks, they kind of went back down to normal. Um, but they were able to talk about this effect right here, this 1,000-step effect, um, more plausibly because they were comparing them to non-players, which acted as their control group. So admittedly, these Pokemon Go players were self-selected into this. But the researchers tried to find a comparable control group. And you can see before, they were pretty comparable. It's not like the Pokemon Go players were less healthy or less active than the non-players. They were basically the same. And then these guys went up and were higher, and then it came back down. So this right here is a difference in difference situation. Um, because if you plot this and you say, hypothetically, had this Pokemon Go group not downloaded Pokemon Go, they would probably be about here after week uh, week two or at week one. And so again, the difference is from the hypothetical endpoint to the actual endpoint. And so right here, you get like an 800 step difference because of Pokemon Go. Um, you, can act, you can look at it this way too at this bar chart. So you can see um, the average steps per day, there's a big difference here, 955 step difference in the first week, and then 900 step difference the second week, and then it starts decreasing over time. By the time you get six weeks into the game, it's only a 130 step, 130 step difference, and it's not a huge difference anymore. Um, but this, what they said in the paper, is this is the causal effect of downloading Pokemon Go on physical activity. That downloading Pokemon Go causes an increase in 1,000 steps on average. That's the average treatment effect. And it's a fairly plausible effect as long as you believe that their treatment group and their control groups are pretty comparable. And if you ran a regression here using their data and you said you just had like a before after um, variable and you had a treatment control variable and you did the interaction for them, the coefficient on that interaction term would say 955. Um, and that is your causal effect. Um, so that is how difference and differences works. Um, you'll get lots of practice with this in the example and in your problem sets. Um, the next couple of problem sets will have diff and diff questions on them. Um, so it's a, it's a fun um, form of, of a quasi-experiment. Tons of economics papers and policy papers that you see will use diff and diff. Um, um, econ PhD students will, like, their job is to kind of write a job market paper that is super polished that gets them out into the world and gets them a job with the Federal Reserve or with a PhD a, a teaching school or something. And often their job market papers will be very, very focused on a very narrow um, um, diff and diff situation. And this is like very standard bread and butter econometrics here. Um, so it's important to understand. Um, and important to understand how to analyze them and, and recognize them, especially when you have the interaction terms. So we'll get some more practice with that. So it'll be fun. <laughs>